Welcome everyone to the April 26, 2023 Pasture Management Series. It's good to see everybody. Hopefully wherever we're at, we're enjoying beautiful weather and, and uh, Mother Nature is giving us that fine springtime with uh, lots of growth, lots of sunshine, hopefully some going to be a lot more rain and hopefully that what we get is a lot of growth in our pastures. So what are we looking at? What are we uh, what are we seeing? What are we looking for? And then what are the some of the questions that we're hoping to answer as we go along from the past month, looking forward into the next month in May? So what's out there? What what have we seen this past month and where are we where is that taking us as we move forward? So what I'm seeing is probably a familiar sight with everybody. I should have put the the state flower of Tennessee up here, at least the state spring flower of Tennessee, the buttercup right here and we we last spoke they were all kind of these green nice little green plants that were kind of hiding right below a lot of the the, the turf grasses that we had and now where we sit today there's nice big beautiful fields of yellow flowers everywhere uh, especially in our equine pastures but really just everywhere and so what we see is a lot of these winter weeds, um, some being perennial, some being annual, are starting to flower. So that means they're already going to seed. And this means it's for the most of these weeds, this is the end of their life for either this year or for uh, forever, depending on if it's a perennial or annual. So when it comes to control, now control is kind of at a mute point. Um, we can control them if we've got hay and we want to kind of, we want to see them dissipate pretty quickly, um, but they're almost at the end of their life. So sometimes control is better saved for the, the coming months and the coming year. Uh, what we're starting to see also is a lot of our cool season grasses are really starting to get thick. We talked about it back in March that it was still a little cool. The soil temperature is a little bit cooler. So our grasses really hadn't taken off. We got about to the 1st of April and a lot of these grasses really started to go. So you started to see those gaps in the cool season forages now really start to fill in as they start to clump out, uh, get a little bit broader leaf. So this is kind of the peak time of some of our cool season pastures. Another thing that we're seeing, especially over the last couple, you know, really the last month, um, but we've seen some especially windy days. And actually we've been kind of unfortunate uh, until I believe last Friday, we have been pretty dry considering the springtime. We usually think of a lot of moisture. Uh, our, a lot of our grounds were getting pretty dry. You had the combination of wind coming across uh, on a daily basis and some pretty, re really windy days. And it was really drying out that top portion of our topsoil, which is causing, I think I even saw some grass and some weeds that were in thin areas really starting to turn and kind of showing some stress. Uh, from drought. So that's the challenge that we get with spring, um, especially when we don't get a lot of frequent rain like we haven't been recently, is it dries out pretty quick and also makes it very challenging if you're trying to do any type of weed control. But um, that's not to be unexpected, but it's still, still an issue that we deal with. And obviously this has been a great month over the past uh, 30 days to be able to put a lot of those inputs in we talked about it in March, another great opportunity to go ahead and get those inputs in. We saw, we're starting to see the, the response rate, especially from a nitrogen. If you put any nitrogen on some of our cool season grasses, that's where you start to really see those grasses accelerate and be able to utilize that. So as we, as we move forward tonight, as we're starting to look into, what are we going to be looking for over the next month? So we're going to talk about clipping and baling and not necessarily the principles or of one or the other, but we're going to talk about just the practice and, and the, the action and the uh, response that you see depending on how you clip or bale or graze. Uh, we're going to look at the quality of grasses and how we can help play a role in determining that. We're going to talk about just crabgrass because I think this is a, as a one of those Mother Nature's great gifts to us that we don't maybe realize, especially if we, it's in our uh, lawns or our yards, but in our pasture settings, this is a really great gift to us. And then we're going to just talk about the principles of if you've got a pasture and you're trying to decide, do you do hay with it? Do you do pastures? Something to consider or factors to look at. So one of the first ones that I want to spend, I want to spend a lot of time on the, our first two topics because I want everybody to really understand the science and the principles of it, because that's going to help you make your decisions. And we've, we've talked many, many times that 
we can develop a plan for this year or for this month. And a month later, that plan is scrapped and we come out with a new plan or we develop a plan. It works perfectly the first year. Next year, we try to replicate it and it's the worst design plan we've ever had. Um, so we want to have that ability that we can we can adapt because we have kind of some of the knowledge to be able to see what's going on and then we can react to that. So one of the first things I want to talk about is just quality. Um, you guys may have seen this before. Uh, it's, a very, it's a very popular graphic, but I think understanding it really helps you be able to make some sound decisions as you go through your pasture, whether it's a pasture or a hay field or whatever that may be, even a yard. Um, so it's one of those inverse relationships of, of quality and yield and when they kind of cross each other on the, the X and Y axis. So when we first start out, if you look at this plant right down here at the very, uh, at the first one on the very left hand side, it is a very, very short, that's kind of one of those new seedlings that's just starting to clump out and a uh, very small root system. But if you look at the top where the quality is at, it is kind of, that's one of the, the peak areas of quality. So that's where the, those richest leaves and, and nutrients and sugar contents are at is in that really young plant. It's really starting to grow. So all the nutrients are coming into the leaf. It's going into energy production to be able to grow. So that's where our peak quality is at. So whenever you start looking at grazing and you're starting to analyze sugar contents, especially in, in uh, some of our cool season grasses, know that at the bottom and those, those new, really young plants that are starting to grow, that's where you're going to start to see the highest quality, um, the highest sugar content. So if you've got some young animals and you're really trying to, um, to maybe reduce your grain, Anytime they're consuming this, they're getting much higher nutrient content than they are down the line in some of these other plants. So as we go down the line, as this plant gets a little bit bigger, and so this is probably somewhere, this is probably early, early April, first couple of weeks, April. Now we're starting to get into late April, um, maybe early, early May, where this plant is just starting to come up. The yield is very, very low on this plant. There's not going to be a whole lot. If we were to clip it, if we were to graze it, we're not getting a ton of grazing. Good news is it's rapidly responding. It's growing pretty fast. But the, the yield, what we're going to get out of it, still pretty small. Uh, the quality, though, is starting to go down slightly. It's still fairly, very high in, in quality content um, as it starts to grow up. Once again, the highest amount of quality content and nutrients down below as it starts to grow up it's a little bit less that's where the bulk of its uh, forage is at uh, the, a lot of fodder so now we start to move into mid-may uh, early to mid-may third week of may fourth week of may where we're starting to see the quality starting to come down the plant is starting to get bigger and the amount of yield that we're getting from that plant is starting to go higher and so that's that point of, do we make some decisions? And so a lot of times that, that second, third week of May, if we're hay producers, we're starting to make some decisions. Do we go ahead and cut? And so uh, the, the decision to make is if you cut at this time, or if you're trying to graze, but if you cut at this time, you're going to get much less on the yield side because it's down below, um, but you're still trying to capture some of that really high quality hay. And so when you start looking at haze and you start trying to, to pick haze, if you're going to um, try to buy hay later, asking what time and when it was cut can play a big role in the, in the quality of the hay. So if you know that it was kind of cut in early May, early to mid-May, second, third week of May, chances are the quality is going to be a lot higher than something that maybe was cut much later, as, you, as you'll see. So right here, we sacrifice yield to increase quality. Then as we go one last one, a little bit further. So what happens here is this transition of this plant. This plant is going from trying to grow, grow, grow to now this plant right over here is trying to turn its um, nutrients from growing. They're trying to turn no those nutrients off to now it's time to be able to reproduce. And so now it's starting to put up that stem with that seed head. And so this is how the plant reproduces and produces the offspring, hopefully for the for the next year, which 
for some of our cool season plants, it's kind of hard to seed and get it uh, reseeded naturally, but it's still, it's producing, um, it's going into reproductive phase. And now it's kind of shutting and spoiling all these nutrients out of the leaves back into this segment. So obviously we've got some bigger leaves. We've got more uh, co um, hay content with the stem, the seed heads. And so our yield is going dramatically up, but our quality is going down. And so there's, there's kind of two different um, ways of looking at it. You'll have a lot of guys um, or, or people producing hay that were looking for tonnage. They're looking for more and more production. So they'll go ahead and cut hay when it's got a lot of seed heads. And so they'll get a lot more hay, but the quality's obviously gone down quite a bit. So if you start buying hay, you see a lot of seed heads, you know you're more than likely going to have a lower quality. So when in hay production, you like to try to be able to cut it when you're just starting to see a few seed heads to, but not very many, but to maximize your yield, but still take advantage of your quality. So this for, for people in owning pastures, this is one thing where you kind of look at is do, when do I need to come through and mow or clip? Because in springtime, depending on the number of animals that you may have running on your property, whether it's goats, uh, cattle, sheep, or horses, you may not have enough animals to be able to consume enough of uh, your grass pasture. So if they're, if they're able to only eat here and because there's only a few of them and they, a lot of the other pasture starts to produce seed heads because they can't get to it quick enough, that may be a situation where you have to go through and, and go ahead and clip those pastures before they can get to it in order to reset that plant. Because once you clip off these seed heads, it brings this plant back into these areas where it's resetting to growth. It's got to get enough nutrients in there where eventually it then will start to produce another seed head. So it depends on the cool season grass as well that you have. If you've got orchard grass, it typically, it's only going to set a seed head one time. Fescue is going to continually try to adapt and set a seed head. You clip it, it tries to come back. So part of that you need to look at throughout the year. The other part when you're looking at it is like cool season grasses, their peak time for nutrient content is the spring. So then as they go into summer, they're going more into survival mode. As they come into fall, they're, they're kind of coming out of survival mode, but they're not really going back into peak because they're getting ready to also shut down again in the winter. So even though this plant has got a lot a higher amount of sugar content in the spring, it's going to, even the same plant's going to, not, even at the same stage, is going to naturally decrease in nutrient content as it starts to go through the summer, and, um, different periods of stress and everything else. So if you understand that, you can kind of adapt. The challenge being with... Um, not having a monoculture or kind of the, the same grass throughout the entire pasture, which very few, if any, pastures truly are a monoculture, is that they produce seed heads at different heights. So the question is, is how do you know when to set seed, uh, when to clip, when to bale based on seed heights, seed head heights, if some of them are producing a seed head at 12 inches and others are producing it at uh, 18 to 24 inches. So that's the challenge. You kind of you, you pick and choose the kind of where it's somewhere in the middle, but that is the challenge when you don't have a monoculture type plant. But it's important if you can understand and, main, and maintain the quality, that'll maintain a higher quality of grass for your animals to be able to graze. So another thing when, when, you're, when you're talking about it is clipping and baling and, and, and grazing height. So these are two really good demonstrations that I have here that I want to be able to show you. Uh, one of them is, is a time-lapse video and one of them is just talking about nutrient content. So baling and grazing height is one of the most important factors in, in response rate of your, of your plant, being able to maintain uh, the infrastructure of your property, to be, uh, of your pasture, being able to control overgrazing. And hopefully, if you're plant, planting a perennial like cool season fescue or, or orchard grass or something like that, or you hope to come up year after year after year, hopefully you can maintain that without having losing some of that every year due to overgrazing stress, whatever that may be. So I want to go through just the grazing height or the mowing height that is so important um, 
to look at. So a lot of times on hay pastures, I'll see people come through that, that are trying to get the biggest amount of tonnage, the highest uh, quantity of hay that they can get. So what they'll do is they'll set their, their mowers for their hay all the way down on the ground to where they're almost scraping the ground. So you're pulling every bit of that plant off. And so right here, what you see is a plant that's been scraped all the way to the ground. Uh, the and then or or you're just grazing. Let's say you're, you're you you've got your animals overstocked and they're continually or they have complete access to all your pastures and they're continually going back to the same areas. So they're overgrazing. So they've got it down almost to the ground. So one of the important things to see is first is just the root development. What happens if you have a plant where let's say you put them in to graze or you mow, but you, at eight inches, eight to 10 inches. Well, let's say you come through and mow it or you allow them to graze it down to four inches. What you see is, looking more importantly down at the root, what you're seeing is you've got really good root development. Not only are these roots going deep into the soil, because if we talk about those windy days that really dry out that first top couple inches of the soil, they can access water that's deep down in the soil they're also accessing nutrients and there's also a lot more pore space. So if we're talking about compaction um, of our soils, lack of absorption in our soils, if there's roots down there going through the soil, they're creating pores or creating spaces in our soil that allows water absorption. So if we run off as an issue, you can a lot of times look back to the, to the height of your plants to see if, um, if you've got these nice tall plants, Inversely, you're going to have nice long roots that are creating pore spaces, opportunities for absorption, and also an opportunity to absorb water to keep them from drying out, especially during the hot summer times. So inversely, what you can see is what the amount of leaf that you can see above the ground is typically about the amount of the leaf that you can see below or about roots that you can see below ground. Look, looking at this middle one, when you take off most of the plant, leaving maybe two or three inches, uh, you, you lose correspondingly about the same amount of roots. They start to die back. They shrink. And you're looking at, look, your roots stop growing for 17 days um, when you take that much off. And then finally, when you just graze it all the way to the ground, when you mow it all the way to the ground, you've completely killed all those roots and you've stopped them from growing for the next 10 days. So what's going to happen right here, and we're going to demonstrate with our little video here, the same amount of roots are, are below ground. So when you get one of those windy days, let's say during the hot summer, it's 85 degrees, it's 90 degrees, it rains an inch. Uh, the next two days, we get a really, uh, really hot and dry wind coming through. This first inch or two inches is completely bone dry, even though we just got an inch. It's bone dry. And so this plant in this situation is completely stressed, even though it just got an inch of rain. Uh, the day before. Um, and so we have no root growth. We've, we're no longer going into the soil profile. We're not a we're, we're opportunity for compaction that's going to come here because there's nothing, there's no roots penetrating that soil to open up spaces. So we have a, a real issue. So what's the, what's the other side of it? Well, the other side is, is just the response rate. How long does it take this plant to come from this short little a uh, stub of a, of a plant that's only got maybe an inch above ground or even less, how long does it take to recover to come back to here? Well, we're looking at root growth in 17 days. And so I want to show a really good response of how, how these plants respond and just how quickly uh, what the grazing height or what the height you leave the, the plant, whether you're mowing or you're starting to graze, what it looks like. So if you'll look at the video, we'll go ahead and start this video real quick. So this was done in Kentucky, and this just is, is highlighting if you let it go down to one inch versus if you let it go to about three or three and a half, four inches. This is over five days. So you could see in that in that short little video just how quickly that plant can respond and regrow and how and the height difference between those two plants based on how much you leave. 
Um, if, you, if you go back to third grade and maybe it's even today, maybe it's it's first grade. I don't know. Who knows? Uh, so not only are the roots kind of stopped, but this plant is growing by photosynthesis. It's catching it. The plant leaves are catching the sunlight and causing it to grow, it brings in energy, cause it to grow. Well, when it's a very short plant uh, leaf length, very short leaf. So it is trying to just grow by energy that it has stored in what little roots it has. So it's a very, very slow process until it can actually get some leaf to catch sunlight. This plant right here is catching, has lots of leaf, has lots of surface area to be able to catch sunlight. So it can rapidly catch a bunch of sunlight, use that energy to turn around and grow. That's why if you can leave it at a, a longer height, it's going to respond and turn over and grow much quicker. So that, and that makes in springtime, it's responding very quickly because it's cool, it's um, it's wet. Hopefully it's gonna respond very quickly. During summer, it's gonna may take a lot longer for that to happen because it doesn't have the right environment, but it's still gonna happen faster for the plant that's not stressed and has not um, been overgrazed or cut down very short. So real quick, we talk about a little bit about pasture and hay. Um, we're going to talk about, you know, sometimes we've, we've been on multiple situations where you're kind of, you're trying, trying to juggle or maybe you've been cutting hay on part of your pastures or part of your property and, and using the other part for hay or for pastures. And so you're trying to decide, do I continue to produce my own hay or do I maybe turn the rest of my, my property over to pastures and utilize that? So a few things to think about, look at is just soil health. Um, and compaction. So pastures, uh, if you've got a pasture, there's more likely a better chance, depending on the species you have and the number of animals you have, um, where compaction is a can be a really big issue. With hay ground, we typically don't see that near as much. You don't have something constantly putting that pressure on there. So we don't see near as much uh, soil compaction on hay ground as we do some, some more pastures that may be overgrown. So thinking about uh, the situation where if you've got way too too many animals on some on a let's say you have 20 acres of property, 10 acres of it you're putting in hay and, and 10 acres of pasture, but the 10 acres of pasture are getting a lot of soil compaction. You may have too many animals on there, and so it would benefit you potentially to be able to transition that other 10 acres to to pasture rather than trying to pull hay off of it. Um, one of the things is just looking at the nutrients difference. So when you are utilizing uh, your, your grasses as pasture, you're gonna have a much higher um, nutrient content in, a lot in your soil. So you're gonna have more likely higher amounts of phosphorus and potassium. Your pH is probably gonna be a little bit higher and potentially you could have some, some nitrogen in there from some of our nitrogen locking plants like clover. Um, but the reason why we have that being a little bit higher in our pastures versus our, our uh, hay fields is, for one, is we're returning a lot of nutrients back into the ground through manure with our pastures. So a lot of those nutrients that the animal is pulling from the plant, it's going through their, their body, whatever they can't use, which is a lot of the, the content that the plant needs, is going back into the ground. And so it's being redistributed in that plant. It's going to use it. With hay, we're typically taking the whole plant, almost the whole plant off of it. And so there's nothing being redistributed back into the ground. So we have to be able to put those inputs back in the ground or, or, uh, or our soil profile will start to be devoid of those nutrients. So typically in pH too, pH, the more nitrogen we put on, uh, which is a pretty much a requirement for a lot of our hay, the more nitrogen we put on, typically our pH is gonna drop much faster than it would be with um, with pastures. With the weeds, and so this is where sometimes a hay field could be converted to a pasture depending on the type of weeds that we start to see. We're going to have two different types of weeds typically uh, showing up in hay fields. Well, that's because some weeds can be uh, very desirable for some of our animals to consume. So in a hay field, we'll typically see some uh, buckhorn weeds. We'll see uh, few other weeds that are typically pretty popular in there that we won't typically see in our pastures. Buckhorn is very desirable, especially for cattle to eat. And so they'll eat that. They'll graze that very well versus 
in hay fields. That's one of the more popular ways to see grasses as well. In hay fields, you'll, a lot of times you'll see a lot of Johnson grass in grazing situations. Very rarely do we see Johnson grass uh, in in some of our pastures. Most species of animals are going to graze that when it's pretty when a very young species, and so they're going to graze it right out of your pasture. So if you've got a hay field, you're just covered up in Johnson grass. Something to think about is to fence off that field, let animals graze it for a while, graze it down, and then you can come back in reseeding or, or do something like that because Johnson grass can be very hard to get rid of uh, any other way. And then you start to see potentially some woody stemmed um, plants that are starting to pop up like uh, blackberries. But sometimes some animals will graze out, especially if you've got some small ruminants. Um, and then the final thing is just the return. Um, we, we talked about if you don't have enough grazing ground for, for some of your animals, uh, allocating some of that property over to, to hay fields can sometimes not really be cost efficient. Even though we're thinking about reproducing our own hay, there's still a cost to that. And the cost to overgrazing can sometimes be as high as $100 per acre is, is the cost it's going to take you to renovate uh, a pasture that's been very compacted and overgrazed and where you've grazed out almost all the nutrients. So something to think about if you're um, looking to make one of those decisions. And then finally, I want to talk just real briefly about um, a crabgrass. So if, you, if you're a, a lawn person, this is your one of your mortal enemies that we, as we come into summer. But as far as the, the, the pastures and the animal side, this can be uh, one of our great saviors for the summer. Uh, timing it, it is really important. Um, it's a it's a growing plant that likes to grow uh, starting probably about late May, mid to late May, and then much through a lot of the fall time, where we start to get into the the cool part of the year. Planting wise, we like to see about mid April um, all the way up till late May, early June is the planting time. Trying if you're wanting to get an earlier established. Uh, pasture. Maybe you're trying to get that in the in the early April, mid-April to get it in the ground so that by the beginning of June, you're starting to get some a pretty established um, pasture. Great. It's a great product for being able to, to utilize in a lot of situations that we'll talk about. Um, variety selection is very important. Um, we have a lot of comments, so there, we have a very big seed bank of mm -hmm of crabgrass. And so when we kind of till up or, or, or scratch the ground during late summer or during late spring in late May, early June, you can kind of bring up some of that seed beds. The deeper we kind of to that we disc or till up, we can really start to bring up a lot of that seed bed. So it's there and we're just kind of activating it. But if you do want to plant some, there's a couple really good varieties. Uh, Red River crabgrass is a very popular one. And then there's another one called Quick and Big. Quick and Big is um, a really popular one out of Oklahoma. There, there's a, a producer called Dal Rimple, Dal Rimple crabgrass. Um, they produce Red River and Quick and Big. They are the gurus of crabgrass and, and really hard to beat anybody that can beat some of their, their types of crabgrass. Some of the positives and negatives of crabgrass and and for one, it, a lot of times it is just that great savior for being able to, to replace places where we had a lot of overgrazing, especially hay feeding. You know, areas that if you'll clean up that hay area that we talked about back in, in March, putting crabgrass in there is a great product to be able to recapture some of that lost ground. Um, excellent during the summer. You can put a lot of animals on it and it responds very well, even though of high heat and, and um, lack of water, it really responds really well. So you can overgraze and overgraze and not really impact it. The challenge being is if you're wanting to do some reseeding or replanting in the fall, it puts a very thick mat on the ground. So if you're, and it does not die off until that first really hard freeze. And so you may be wanting to do some renovations in, in the September or September, or early October, it still may be thriving. And so being able to plant a seed in that thick mat can be challenging. So sometimes we have to either terminate it or really disc it or aerate it up to create some of those opportunities. So um, as we talk about that in the upcoming fall, we'll talk about being able to uh, renovate a situation that was pretty thick from crabgrass. And for one, it's just, a, it's a very desirable product. All of our species of, of animals really enjoy grazing it. 
And so making, you know, making it available is another opportunity. So we can control some weeds so that they don't pop up and take some of those blank spots during the summer. And hopefully then a, a crabgrass will, will pop up. Uh, one of the true great things about it is it is an annual. So, you know, you think about it that it has to be planted every year, uh, but it's got a lot of perennial properties. Uh, if you go ahead and if you're actually trying to reseed it, if you'll reseed it the first year, and especially if like this quick and big variety reseed it that first year, the second year you you scratch the surface a little bit, reseed about 50% the next year. The third year you come by, you scratch the surface again. Maybe you add 25%, maybe you don't need to add any. It's going to start reproducing on its own quite frequently, even though it's an annual. And so you really get a, a, the perennial properties from an annual grass. Uh, really great product and really probably uh, not utilized near enough in a lot of our situations. So we are at that. I'm sorry I had to speak really fast. This was a, uh, there's a lot of really great topics I wanted to talk about this month and, and a, a lot of principles that I think are really important to apply. Um, so we're looking forward to our next session is going to be May 24th. We're going to just talk about a lot of our summer preparations, summer planning, kind of working out what that whole summer looks like talking about some summer grasses that are potentially besides crabgrass that we can look at utilizing. And we're going to look at um, the nutrient content of our summer grasses, maybe compared to some of our uh, cool season grasses. So I thank everybody and hope everybody has a great night. We'll stop recording.